Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to La Jolla Community Church. We're so glad to see you here with us this morning. Would you stand and join me in worshiping the Lord together? Every power 
Good morning once again to La Jolla Community Church. We are glad to see you here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, just a couple of quick reminders. On your way in, you should have received a, uh, a bulletin. On it, you have both a connect card and a prayer card. Um, if you're joining us for the first time today, a welcome. And uh, we would encourage you to fill out the connect card. Uh, let us know uh, you're here. We can connect with you, get you plugged into the church. Also, we would encourage you to fill out the prayer card, which is directly on the back. Uh, let us know how we can pray for you uh, along the week, uh, during the week. Our prayer team will pray for you. Um, on your way out today, uh, you can return the prayer card or connect card along with any tithes or offerings in the prayer boxes in the foyer just outside the sanctuary. And with that, I'd like to welcome up Pastor Steve. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, uh, gee, okay. Well, uh, I was watching a four-year-old skateboard. Uh, there's nothing more impressive than watching a four-year-old skateboard because the armor that they wear, uh, the armor that mom makes them wear looks so uh, overwhelmingly intimidating, makes them look invincible. But I could see that level of armor represented maybe a new experience. This kid can ride a bike with no training wheels, but a skateboard is a little bit more uh, high risk, you know, orthopedically uh, aligned. And so I noticed that uh, he, he turned back and looked at his mom who was filming it, and he walked up bravely and got on that thing, and he was set in stone because he was so focused on being on the board that 
the, tr the path he's on, the paved path in the park adjacent to their home, went to the right. But because he was so focused and the board was, and his, and his footing, he's a goofy footer, so he was, his weight was such that it was naturally going to go to the left. And so you could see that his whole focus was staying upright on the board, aware that there was a trail here, but actually looking for a safe landing on the lawn over here. Uh, and, and so he made it. He hit, he hit the lawn. Uh, uh, I guess he could be a stuntman because he, he did a really good recovery that popped up, and I'm here. I'm okay. Have you ever had an experience like that where you were driving uh, the curves in La Jolla, and you're driving, and you're looking at that median in the middle of the road, and you're looking at it to the point that you're getting very nervous about hitting it? Have you ever been on the Coronado Bridge? That bridge is high and curvy. Have you ever had that sense, especially when there's a lot of traffic, that if you're adjacent to the wall, you're going to hit it? I see heads nodding, yeah. Uh, do you know that every year, every month, every week, every month of every year in lots of states, uh, people hit parked emergency vehicles off to the side of the road, uh, policemen, highway patrolmen, uh, emergency vehicles. And so, you know, most states have now instituted, California has laws that say you can't drive close to them. You have to, if you can, get, to, get in the next lane, uh, or give them a wide berth. Why? It's this whole thing called target fixation. Target fixation. And what happens is we focus on something to the point that we get locked in. And so at first people thought, hey, they're trying to take out emergency people. But then they noticed the pattern was that people get so uptight when they see one of these emergency vehicles, it's like a moth to a flame. And they just, they, they start looking at it. Uh, it's like a person on a motorcycle saying, I don't want to hit that, I don't want to hit that, I'm going to hit that. It's, it's a scary kind of a thing, right? Uh, you're over-focusing on something that is, is distracting or dangerous and sometimes rewarding. Sometimes you're going for something to such, uh, to, to such a high degree, but you're not aware of anything else, and it sets you up for some dangerous and, and difficult situations. Um, the way I would say it is this, you're focused, but you're unaware. You're focused, but you're unaware. You're locked on, but you're not aware of what's around you, uh, and you don't know quite what to do. It's common in flying a plane, driving a car, surfing, skateboarding, etc. So you, you neglect everything else, and you can't avoid a co collision. The funny thing is, and not so funny as in humorously funny, but the really interesting thing is you can avoid the collision just by slightly shifting your weight, slightly shifting your gaze. Now, this four-year-old is going to learn that. When I'm going in this direction and I don't want to end there, uh, I look to where I want to go and I adjust the weight of my body slightly uh, to, to make that work. So it matters what we choose to focus on and attach to in life, right? It's, a, it's an obvious thing. But this idea of, of target fixation uh, permeates everything we do. If you've ever wrestled with an addiction, uh, you have wrestled with target fixation. Your whole life is focused on the addiction. Uh, if I was to say, please, 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 do not think of a hot fudge Sunday right now. Do, uh, 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 think of anything else, but do not right now think of a hot fudge Sunday. Uh, and if you love hot fudge Sundays, you're starting to have hot fudge Sunday target fixation. And you'll be sitting here for the next few minutes thinking, how can I slip out in a way that doesn't cause a lot of attention and make myself a hot fudge Sunday? Uh, so it's a new term. It, was, it really came out of World War II because they found that pilots were focusing on targets and then hitting them. And it was not good for the plane or the pilot, right? And, and we've seen it happen uh, in, in lots of other areas. So I ask you the question, what are you focusing on? What are you focusing on so intently that it might be putting you in danger, putting you at risk, causing problems for you, even though you think you're doing the right thing and you're trying to do it the right way by being so focused? I can tell you what, when kids are sitting together in a car on a long drive, they do not like target fixation. Mom, he's looking at me. Wow, I can't look at people? Don't look at me. And, you know, it's that sort of a thing. We don't like it when people are looking at us. Uh, people get very self-conscious very quickly. I, I want to I give you a, another perspective on this. Uh, it's out of Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24. And, you know, that was a critical time in Israel's history. Uh, they'd already been carried off in one wave of captivity, and now it looked like there's going to be another wave. And God sends Jeremiah to speak to the people, and eventually they are carried off into captivity. Uh, and there's a problem. There was a, there was a target fixation problem. 
in Israel. And God speaks to them through Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says in 9, 23 to 24, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness righteousness on earth, and in these I delight. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, because I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, and in these things, for these things, I take delight. Powerful, powerful message. What does it have to do with target fixation? Well, we're going to talk about that. Uh, First of all, this word boast uh, is a word we don't use a lot. Uh, we, we find more sophisticated ways to boast than just use the word. You don't, you don't say, I, hold on a second, it's been great having dinner with you. I just want to take a few moments to boast about myself. We do it a little bit more subtly. Oh, you did that? Well, I did something even more impressive. Let me tell you about it. And, and we find all kinds of smooth ways to boast. Uh, uh, if, if anybody ever says, hey, did I, did I show you the pictures of my grandchildren? Just say no, thank you very much, and then slowly walk away from them. Just back back away Uh, or get distracted or distract them. Uh, But boast, this word boast is from the root, uh, Hebrew word, uh, root called halal. Halal is the the root of this. Um, And you might already think, hey, halal, that's like hallelujah. Yeah, right, because the the root, halal, is the same that we come up with the words like shine or shining, glory, glorying, praise, praising. But in this case, uh, they're, they're using this word that is often used to praise God as a way of boasting. It's self-praise. They're invoking self-praise about their excellence, my wisdom, my strength, my wealth. Uh, there's a word called hubris, right? The, the, the pride that goes before a fall. That sense that I am just so awesome, you can't even believe it. It's when you watch any of those reality shows, and if, there's a, if it's a competitive show, and, and they'll, they'll, the way they edit those things, it's always goofy because you think it's right down to the second, and it's not, but anyway... They'll have this one moment right before the last sequence to see who wins. And they'll, they'll give you a little heads up when one of the can- characters says, I think I got this in the bag. And you, you're going down. That's it. You just confirmed that because it looked like it, and this guy believes it, or she thinks it's going to happen. And you think, oh, you're boasting hubris. We know that the universe does not re- reward hubris. Uh, you can get reelected and reelected, but somehow in other ways, uh, the world does not reward hubris. Uh, we're seeing it played out in our political system right now. There's so much, so much hubris to go around. You'd think it was a bumper year for hubris. That you could feed the world on hubris if it was wheat. You could power the world on hubris if it was fuel. Uh, it, it's, if it was the alternative source of all energy, it would be magnificent because we have so much of it available. It's, there's, it's the most present thing in the universe. It's hydrogen than hubris that fills the universe, right? And yet it's about excellence. What's there not to like about? Gosh, my, my wisdom, my strength. Hey, good for you. I love to be around wise people. I love to be around strong people. I love to be around people who are rich in the sense that they have rich experiences. They have all kinds of resources that they use in really beautiful and, and oppressive ways. What's there not to like about that? Except for when, it's, when it becomes a version of target fixation. It's about me, 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 me. You think, wow. You so shrunk it to this one point that you're in danger. You're going to hit something hard. And you're going to miss all the cues that would allow you to adjust so that you could actually glory in those things, but not be contained by them and destroyed by them. So what is excellence? Uh, It's not a bad thing. I mean, these people are, are boasting about it, but what is it? Is excellence perfection? Is it people's approval? Is it material success? Is it recognition? Yeah, it can, it can include all those things, right? Uh, we don't like talking about excellence a lot these days because we get nervous. Uh, it might be that somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. We see excellence as often a zero-sum game. You have to slice the pie thinner. Instead of seeing it as a zero-sum game, not an anti-zero-sum game, meaning that the pie gets bigger. Everybody can be excellent in different ways. I mean, if, if, not what, if that's not true, what are the Olympics and the Paralympics and the Special Olympics? Celebrations of athletic 
excellence in appropriate ways that make a lot of sense to us, right? You would never say, well, you know, really the only one that counts is the Olympics. You'd say, no, what counts is an, a, an athlete maximizing their capacity in ways that just tell us they're excellent. You can be excellent as a beginning piano player. Only your teacher will tell you that. Your parents might, but the idea is you can, at any level, any stage in life, do something at the highest level possible in that stage and with your capacity. So you see where this goes. That excellence is a fantastic thing. But what if excellence is simply becoming the best version of you in relationship to the Lord, to the one who made you and gives you those capacities and makes possible the world in which we live? This is what it means to be made in the image of God. Not just to have capacities. We, 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 can, we can make a case that uh, all the capacities that humans have uh, you know, reveal that we are unique in creation. The fact is that lots of things that are created by God have capacities. Uh, we're going to explore this in more depth uh, in conversations today and also next week we come back on this theme of uh, image, being made in the image of God. But ultimately image uh, is about doing the work that God has called us to do. It's not just having the capacities, because lots of creatures have capacities, amazing capacities, to see things that we can't see, do things that we can't do, hear things that we can't hear. But what we have and that is unique to us is that God made us in his image and said, and this is your work, to interact with creation in a way that's very, very specific to who you are and what you can do and how you were created. And so it's, 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 it's accepting that you are an unrepeatable miracle of God's handiwork. That's what excellence is. And excellence only works if it's grounded in authenticity. If it's grounded in authenticity, if it's real, if it's genuine, if it's true. Because faux excellence uh, is a tragedy. You know, the, the, the varsity blues whole thing with people trying to buy their kids way into college. Uh, wow, what a devastating thing for the kid to find out that that was happening or to be complicit in it. Uh, what, a, what a tragedy uh, for us to tell kids, you should get good grades. And when they get good grades and they get caught for cheating, what could they say? Every teacher has heard this. Yeah, but I'm supposed to get good grades. How else was I supposed to do it? Everybody does this. I remember one time uh, one of our kids coming home saying, I think I need to start taking Ritalin. Really, self, self-prescribed. It's good to be 10 years old and know how to do you know, pharmacy. You're a pharmacological genius. I said, why do you think you need Ritalin? Because all my friends are taking it. It helps them focus. Wow, okay. So it's not a faux sense of excellence. It's not inauthentic excellence. I got the job done. Yeah, but you lied, cheated, you stole. This is a big issue in every one of the biotech confer- you know, uh, firms in our area. We are, of course, biotech central, right? Just drive up and down any street around here, uh, up and down Torrey Pines Road. It's insane. What's insane is how much cheating goes on in terms of applying for grants or fudging data so they can get more grants. And this is the bane of every scientific community to say, listen, folks, do not do that. Yeah, but I won't be able to achieve and succeed. Don't do it. We'll help you find ways to achieve and succeed. Don't game the system. Gain your excellence with authenticity. Again, authenticity is accepting that you are an unrepeatable miracle of God's handiwork. Authenticity is defined by the true Lord of heaven and earth who says, you have worth. You can earn achievement, but worth is given you as a gift. No one can take your worth away from you. That's why we're such, we're such champions of, of human trafficking issues or, or economic issues that would hold people back. We're not saying it's not okay to make money and be successful. We're saying, at what cost? At whose expense? We want honest excellence, right? That authentic excellence. And so it's understanding that we're made in the image of God, and the best version of us is us in Him. Why wouldn't it be so if He's the one who created us and gave us the capacity? Yes, we can draw from all the great resources, going to school, getting mentored, all the wonderful life experiences you can have, but ultimately it's the being best version of you in Him that makes you the most authentic version of you. So He can then lead us and guide us into excellence that has no downside. He refocuses us and rescues us from target fixation. 
I was so focused. I had to do anything and everything. You know, bearing God's image isn't faking your way through life as an imposter. Moses ran into this. Uh, Moses was up on the mountain with God, came back. He had the, the Shekinah glory of God, this, this glory of God on his countenance. The people were so intimidated by it. They said, wow, to look at you with that, uh, wow, we're intimidated. And so they asked him to put on a mask. And so Moses masked himself, and which was fine. But at some point, the glory faded. If you've been to a Young Life camp, if you've been to Forest Home, if you've done anything, at some point the glory fades. It doesn't say it wasn't a real experience, it just then becomes integrated into your normal life experience. So how long did that take? A day? A week? Two months? I don't know. But when it is over, uh, Moses was not over wearing the mask. He kept wearing the mask. Why did he feel like he had to be a poser? Because he was the leader all the hopes of Israel were on him. And when there were conflicts and he was being challenged, he, he just kind of went like this, the mask, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're the guy who... Now if he takes it off, they're going, oh, we're recalibrating who's the leader now. There's no more glory on you. I wonder if we need a, a, a regime change. You see where this goes? We live in a world that's so intensely pressurized that 82% of people in our culture identify as imposters. They say, at some point, I've struggled with being an imposter. 80, 82%, which means that there's 18% of people out there who are liars. Because every one of us, at some point, had to say, i, I got to fake it until I make it. There's books written on this. Just look like you're supposed to be there. Just look like you're supposed to be there. I had a friend whose big deal was to break into every uh, kind of Hollywood event that, that we, there was no way he'd get into. Academy Award events, Grammy events, stuff. Uh, he went on to be a, a clinical psychologist. I can only imagine why. And a great writer. He's very funny. Uh, uh, we've had him speak here before. I won't tell you about him, but John Orberg is an amazing guy. <laughs> and he'll tell you about it. He goes, I don't know. I was just really into that. And, I had to, and so what did you do? Well, I just dressed the part. I got in there, and, and I just looked like I belonged there. Like, for how long can you look like you belong there? And so somebody says, hey, obviously you belong here. What do you do? Uh, I sneak into events like this? No. So this, this poser thing is what Moses was wrestling with. All of us can do that. But bearing God's image is being authentic, using your God-given gifts and skills to love and bless his creation. You don't have to apologize for not being perfect or being insecure Sometimes you do have to put on a brave face and we're going to go for it. When your little child looks in your eye and says, am I going to be okay? You know there's going to be several steps of not okay before you get to okay, but you'll say, yes, honey, you're going to be okay. So we can justify being brave and saying this is going to turn out okay. But to live in a sense of, I just hope they don't find out who I really am and what I'm really not, is overwhelming. We see what Micah says, uh, the great prophet Micah. He says, he's shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Humbly, meaning I'm not perfect. I do belong here because God invited me. I'm his guest. He's my host. And so I'm just here to enjoy it. I don't have to apologize for not being anybody but me. I can be comfortable in my own skin. And you know what is the most attractive thing when you meet a person? It's when they're comfortable in their own skin. Not smug, I'm awesome, you're not. Not self-satisfied. Well, did I ever tell you about my strength and my wisdom and my riches? But rather they're simply comfortable in their own skin. And so this is how we express God's image, walking humbly with him in love, mercy, and justice. It's you, fully alive and aware of your capacity in him to bless other people and to care for creation as God's beloved. And this is your genuine, real, and true self. It's your genuine, real, true self, and it's impossible to attain without him. This is the rub. This is why people in the church often fake it till they make it. Until they get exhausted and say, I don't like going to church. Or, 
you know, church just doesn't, just, just doesn't meet my needs. You go, wow, wow. Have you, did, we've asked you to be in a, in a community group. Are you in a, no, no, I don't need that. Okay. We've asked you to explore God's word. No, no, we don't have time for that. Hmm. Uh, we've shown you how to pray and how to spend time with God. Yeah, I know that's great and everything for some people. I'm just not that kind of guy. And at some point you say, wow, uh, I don't know what else we could do for you. But this is your real, genuine, true self, to be in a life-changing relationship with God. Not because we're changing our life, but because he's changing the way we experience our life. Through, the, through making decisions, through recovering from bad decisions, he's there with us, allowing us to grow into our fullest potential as human beings. I hope you're experiencing that. I hope you're experiencing some level of progress, as small as it is that, you know, some things are starting to get, come clear to me. About it. It's okay to be me, to admit when I'm, I'm struggling, to admit when I'm wrong, to change my mind, to ask for help. I mean, if it's impossible to achieve without God, why wouldn't we let God help us achieve it? He's already granted us the worth of being made in His image. See, Jesus said it this way. You see this in John 15, 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Imagine the branches talking to each other. You know, I, I don't tell a lot of people this. I really don't belong here. Why not? I'm just, I don't know, I have no idea how to bear fruit. I've never done it before. It was just hold on. Just stick with him, you will bear fruit. Right? He makes it happen. He makes it happen. And, and, if, and if the branches just say, well, I, I did bear fruit. That was true, but they're so little. They're not much and not very many of them. Yeah, but you notice the people eating those fruit are saying they're the best ones they've ever had. Have you had one of those little wild French strawberries before? Those tiny? What do you call them? Fray de Bois or something like that? They, they're the little tiny, tiny, tiny. And you look at them and you think, oh man, poor thing. You take one bite. It's spectacular. You think, this is the best strawberry I've ever had, right? And so somebody has called it practicing the presence of God. As we're in this vine-branch relationship, being sustained, nurtured, corrected, you know, pruned, and given the chance to really grow into our, our fullest capacities, it's like practicing the presence of God. You're saying, okay, I'm getting used to how to function this way. It's becoming normative to me. The lingo that was so confusing when I first got involved in this is starting to make sense to me. I start to see patterns when I read the Bible. I start to see some patterns as I relate to people. I start to not expect prayer to be like a vending machine. I start to see it as a conversation. And, and in this practicing the presence of God, a guy named Brother Lawrence washing dishes in a monastery wrote this book, Practicing the Presence of God. It's a, it's a spiritual classic written by a guy probably who would discount himself for being half as smart as all the other brothers. But he simply washed dishes, praising God and praying for people. You know, it's possible to praise God and, and pray for people while changing diapers, washing dishes, working in the garden, taking a walk, sitting in traffic school. Oh, no. Um, but, you know, you can, t you can stake your ground anywhere to say, Lord, what does it look like for me to be, you know, reflecting on who I am in you and using whatever I, I sense I have in my hand to bless people in your name? And so we have the Holy Spirit, we have the Word of God, we have the church, we have a family, hopefully, that gives us critical knowledge and habits and skills for life. This is all part of this authentic growth in excellence. When we stop having this target fixation of things that don't produce life, and we start having a a, a target focus and awareness of things that do produce life, that allow us to see lots of things at the same time. Yes, I can focus on this. I don't want to hit that wall, so instead of focusing more on that wall, or that, that median, I'm going to look at the road ahead, and that's where I want to go. And so the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, these express this process. These start to emerge in us. And, and they start to emerge in a community of people who have those qualities. And so it's not just you know, me being blessed, it's us blessing one another and blessing the world. And when you have a wild, wild idea and you say, hey, I'm going to do this thing with Habitat, uh, I, could, I can include 10 people, I'd love you guys to do this. We could be a, a net blessing 
And all of a sudden you get this viral, positive viral thing, this upward spiral of virtue that allows us to be part of this movement of God's Spirit. It's excellent because it's authentic. And yes, it is strong, and it does uh, look like wisdom, and it, it does bear all kinds of riches, but it, from a whole other, another perspective than we initially thought we needed to do. And so it's how we deal with the pressure to boast or prove our worth in a self-promoting world. Do you ever wrestle with that? Proving your worth. What have you done for me lately in this world? It applies to us individually. It applies to us as we reboot La Jolla Community Church. We're in a new season. We're in a natural life cycle place. We've gone through this life cycle together over 17 years. And now we're at a point in the life cycle where we need to reboot and reset where we want to be in that life cycle. It's a very exciting time. I'm all in. I love this idea that we together can say, hey, what does our mission look like now? But the, the question isn't a target fixation question. How do we become a big church like we were? How do we get money to fund things? How do we get people? How do we create programs that are just so incredibly sensationally attractive? You see, that's a target fixation that is foolishness. Rather, we're saying, what is the Lord doing in us, and what does the Lord want to do in us that we can respond to and cooperate with that would be authentic and excellent as we lean in and say, what is God doing in our midst? What's God doing in our community? How can we contribute to that to glorify Him and bless people? To do that, we, we had our, at our Jan, a June meeting, we, we told you all about our plan to, you know, to engage uh, uh, an outside firm to help us get organized to do that. Uh, we told you we'd be advising you on that. We'll have something to tell you, you know, further into the summer. What I can tell you, though, is that we are going to do a thorough prayerful search and we'll be aware of target fixation. We want to focus on the right things, not the wrong things. And so if we, as we engage candidates down the road, we'll ask them to talk of their wisdom and their strengths and the riches of their experience. We want to know about that. We're not forcing them or asking them to boast. But tell us another awesome thing about you. But we do want to know, what are your competencies? Uh, what have you done to grow and to engage as a leader? And what did that look like? But we really want to know this. We want to know if they have an understanding to know the Lord, who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. Because these are the things that God delights in, and these are the things that we delight in. Are you with me on this? Uh, Samuel, remember the prophet Samuel? Saul was not working out as a king. It was time to have a regime change. And he was doing a fine job except for killing everybody. And so it was not looking good. And so Samuel was tasked with going out and finding the next king. Now, he was in a big I told you so moment because he'd already told the people, well, you don't need a king to begin with because all they do is they do bad things. No, no, we have to have a king. Everybody else has a king. And so reluctantly, God allowed them to have a king. It didn't work out too well. So go find another king. And so Samuel goes to Bethlehem, and he interviews seven of Jesse's sons. All very impressive guys. First of all, it's impressive he has seven sons. He actually has one more than seven. So they all come out. It's like you know, a, a runway kind of a thing. You know, They're all qualified. They're all experienced. They're all credible. They're all believable. They're all likable. They're all boastworthy. And, and Sam was going, wow, which, that one, no, no, wait, that one, no. He, well, that guy is, every one of them uh, were candidates. And the Lord said to Samuel, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, which you have seen is very impressive. And these are really impressive people in, internally as well. But the Lord looks at the heart. And at the heart of this choice, I have a particular goal in mind. So here's Samuel, almost apologetically, I'm guessing, looking at Jesse and all these phenomenal guys going, uh, any more? Any more? There's seven of us. Uh, and, and of course, then Jesse says, yeah, go get the kid tending the sheep in the field. We don't know in these processes. The target fixation Starts as let's focus and make sure we have everything in order and we've considered everything. At some point, we just want a solution. But God often says, granted, you're going to get a solution, but when I do something, I'm doing it not just to solve one thing, I'm doing it to solve a lot of things. 
We have an example in Paul when he was challenged to prove his worth and status as an apostle. You might think that is ridiculous. Why would anybody do that? If you read uh, 2 Corinthians carefully, you will understand that Paul went through a major, major breakdown in his, in his person. He went through that discouraging moment when you say, I don't know, we would call it a midlife crisis, you might call it burnout, you might call it any number of things, where he was so discouraged. And it was because this church he'd poured so much into had done so much for Corinth, a Greek-thinking church said, hey, you know, we've, we've been introduced to some very impressive leaders lately who are telling us that you're really not up to snuff, you're not up to par. And we want to give you a chance to boast to see if you're as good as these guys are. If not, we're not sure what we're going to do. And so the pressure's on him. He's hurt, he's annoyed, dismayed, intimidated, he's stressed, he's discouraged by their demands. But wisely, he doesn't take the bait to boast about his calling or accomplishes, accomplishments. He's smart enough to process his feelings like this is wrong on every level. And plus, I'm not that hot anyway. So they, they got a point, you know. But still, I know that God's called me to do this. And so he reframes it for them. And so remember that boast word is from halal, and it can go to hallelujah. They were saying to him, we want you to prove your worth. And he could have said, hell yeah, I'll prove my worth. Instead, he said, hallelujah. I'm going to point to the God who is good, who has called me and has cared for me in the midst of this ministry that I've been faithfully doing. And so he boasts about the things that they would consider confirmation of his fallibility, his failure, and even his humiliation. Bear with me, I'll read through this. He starts out by saying, I have worked, I have worked much harder. Well, we would say, yeah, that's a boast. No, they would hear much harder as, I'm a loser, I have to work hard. Because in the Greek and Roman mind, it's, if you have to work, you're a chump. We do not work, we're elites. We, we just stand around the agora, or we stand around the marketplace, we stand in places of learning, and we just see, you know, how awesome we are. We have other people. We have minions. We call them slaves who do all the heavy lifting. So the fact you're working hard, there's a problem here. What kind of leader are you if you're working hard? He goes on. I've been in prison more frequently. Oh, this is getting really good. What kind of loser goes to prison? Who couldn't you bribe? What couldn't you do to avoid, you know, going to prison? I've been flogged more severely. Oh, (laughs) flogging. That's the kind of leader we want who deserves flogging. And I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. And he may as well have been nailing his hammer, his his coffin shut. Because these do not sound impressive. They wanted to hear him boast of his strength and his wisdom and his riches. He wouldn't do it. And in humility and vulnerability, he turned their demand to prove his worth and status upside down. So he says this, If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. Now he tells this ridiculous story at his own expense. He says, In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. So he's in Damascus, Syria, surrounded, and they're going to catch him. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. Oh, wow. Okay, very brave of you. He's telling this story in, in, in abject um, um, opposite of what a brave person would do. I was lowered from the wall so I could escape in a basket. Really? Now here's what he's doing. He's contrasting his humiliating escape from Damascus. He's contrasting it to the highest Roman military honor. Their version of the Congressional Medal of Honor. 
uh, the corona moralis. It was given to the, that soldier, who, the first soldier to take the wall and plant the Roman flag on the wall and lead the troops in, to take the city. You see the, the mock of this that he's doing? He's saying, let me tell you how impressive I am. You want to know impressive? Check this story out. Mocking them, hopefully, not out of disrespect, but to say, can you see what you're doing here? Have you lost sight of the fact? You're, you're focusing on this target fixation of something that is awesome that has nothing to do with what God is actually doing in this world and that we have the joy and the privilege of being a part of. Now he resists the temptation to self-promote, but he doesn't lack confidence or conviction. So, so the thing is, I'm so weak, it's that, no, I, I'm, I'm called and I'm, I'm equipped and I'm competent, but I'm telling you, it's not enough for what the challenge is. And it's God who provides for me. And therefore I'm confident enough to tell you in humility and vulnerability where I feel weak, where I have failed. Where Wouldn't you like to hear that from a leader sometime? When you hear that from a leader, and now they say it superficially, oh, that's bad on me. The guy that lost a zillion dollars in cryptocurrency said, oh, bad, it's on me. Like, whoa, 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 let's back up, on you. You're fired. That's what it means to be on you. Or you're going to pay all the money back. We say it so complacently, kind of a smirk almost. A true leader says, uh, this is what we did. It didn't work. Here's the plan for what we're going to do now. Here's what we need. We built a team that would complement my skills, and we're going to... And people would say, all right, we get it, because it's hard to do the stuff we're trying to do. And so he says... Now, this is our boast. Our, conscious, our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world, and especially in our relationships with you, with integrity and godly sincerity. So he says, look, we're doing things the right way. We just can't control the outcome. We simply trust the Lord, doing our very best, but we do it with integrity and sincerity. We're doing it with authenticity. He knows his strength is in the Lord, so even his weakness serves as a redemptive, a redemptive component and purpose. Redemptive just means that this still blesses people and glorifies God and gets the job done. Redemptive. God will do some redemptive things in the wreckage of your life. You'll think this is just horrible. Right, but even in this, God is doing something to redeem you and redeem people. And so Paul asked the Lord three times to remove his weakness. And he tells these people in the letter God's response. He says, look, I asked the Lord to remove my weaknesses. Who needs weaknesses? But God told me this. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses, Paul says, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. I so much want it to be about me. God says, hey, I got a better idea. Let's make it about me, and you get to be fully part of it. Ah, yeah, better, better. See, I don't need you to be strong, Steve. I need you to be strong in me. Yeah, but it's my responsibility. I'm the eldest of five kids. I need to step up and write. Congratulations. Love the attitude. Great attitude. However, let's right-size this, reframe this, refocus this. In me, we will do great things. It will be costly, you will suffer, you'll sacrifice. You'll do all the leadership things, but ultimately it's not about you. It's about me in you. Let me reiterate, it's not a rationale for mediocrity, lazy, or inattention. It's not the hope that you'll be lucky. I was just more lucky. You're lucky. I haven't been lucky. It's not about luck. It's about focus. You all know the name Vin Scully. Everybody know the name Vin Scully? The greatest sportscaster of all time. Died this week at age 94. Started with the Brooklyn Dodgers uh, at, uh, I think he was like 22 or something like that, and ended up with the L.A. Dodgers. By the time he was he retired at 88. Faced some very tough things in life. His wife, early on, with he had three kids, his wife died. Then one of his kids died in a helicopter wreck. And then his second wife died. He went through a lot. But he was this incredible, incredible presence. And he would talk about life in that booth. He would inspire people talking about baseball. Good luck with that. And a young sportscaster a few years ago, uh, my favorite sportscaster out of the Wall Street Journal, Jason Gay. 
if you like cars and stuff like that, Dan Neal is in the Wall Street Journal on Saturday. Jason Gay, likewise. Jason Gay interviewed him a few years ago. I said, hey, how does it feel? First of all, he said, you know, you're my idol, and I'm not worthy. Thank you for meeting with me, letting me interview you. And at the end of the interview, he said, hey, um, you feel lucky. You've got to do all this. You have to live during this time. The greatest time of baseball. This is what he said, because he was a man of deep faith, a Catholic Christian, committed um, to his faith, worshiping in church, being part of a Christian community, went to Fordham University, a Jesuit school in New York. He said, oh, no, not lucky. No, not lucky. Lucky is too cheap a word. I really feel blessed. I see that T-shirt back there. It says, blessed, would you please stand up? My favorite United Airlines pilot. Uh, you, turn, you see, there you go. Blessed, right? Blessed. Blessed. What a difference. You know, it doesn't say awesome. Safe to fly with me. You know, mostly I get to where we're flying. No, blessed. I'm blessed. And so that's what he said. I really feel blessed. I truly believe God has given me these gifts. He gave it to me at a young age, and he's allowed me to keep it all these years. That's a gift. I say this because I believe it. I should spend a lot more time on my knees than I do. He said, Vin Scully said this. So excellence is simply recognizing God's image in you and embracing God's power to bring it to great effect, to heal you, to humble you, to rescue you, to refocus you, to lift you up, to calm you down, to hold you back, to push you out. It might not be impressive to anybody else, but you'll know that God makes these things possible in you. You won't boast about being lucky. You'll give God the praise he's due for blessing you. You'll no longer feel like an imposter because it's not about impressing anybody. It's about you being impressed by God. You'll know it's about his love for you. You'll know it's about his powerful grace allowing you to grow into excellence authentically. Why? How do you know that? Because you'll learn that excellence is asking for help. Excellence is confessing that you don't quite know what to do and you need some guidance. Excellence is saying, I'll work as hard as I can. I just want to learn how to work smart, too. Excellence is recovering from failure. Excellence is serving others. Excellence is trusting in God. And this is what being vitally alive and free in the image of God looks like and feels like. We're free to commit and we're free to adapt. Are you ready to commit and to adapt to the next iteration of what this church could be? I hope you are. Because if you don't commit and if you don't adapt, there is no future in our church. This is why churches and any organization comes off the rails. Because people get distracted. They get fixated on lesser things. I don't mean lesser when I say I had to deal with my family or my work. No, I'm saying lesser things. Your glory, your greatness, your expectations. We are free to pursue excellence because it's worth it and we're worth it according to God. We're free to grow up in Christ as his beloved child because we bear his image. We can do this all of our life until he calls us home. I want to leave you with Paul's prayer for the Philippians. He said this, Philippians 1, 9 to 11. We don't have a slide. Philippians 1, 9 to 11. My prayer for you is this, that you would have still more love. A love that is full of knowledge and every wise insight, and that you would be able always to recognize the highest and the best that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's my prayer for me. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for all of us as we move into a holy communion. Uh, I want to ask the people who are going to be uh, serving communion to to get up and go where they need to go. And when you uh, while we're going to play music uh, you're free to get up and, and go receive Holy Communion you hear something like this this is Christ's a body given for you this is Christ's blood shed for you uh, receive it, you, we're still using these little kits, uh, take the bread out first and then t- drink from the, 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 the juice um, and come back to your seat and just be praying about where are you in Christ right now how are you embracing this notion of bearing his image Pray for this church as as we pursue the mission that we've seen God work through powerfully for so many years. Uh, If you want to be prayed for, go right around the corner. There's a beautiful prayer garden out front there, as you know. And let some people pray for you if you have a concern for you or other people. I guess something to eat. 
and then come back at 11, and we're going to have a really, really great uh, conversations uh, encounter for about 45 minutes here. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus, having blessed the bread, took it and broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, the bread of life, whose image we bear. Likewise, he took the cup and having blessed it, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Uh, the, the cup of Elijah, never drunk during the Seder, never even addressed. And Jesus took that cup and drank from it. And it's his unconditional love for us, accepting us right where we are, taking us where he alone can take us, that continually draws us back uh, to this thing we call the Eucharist, uh, the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. He welcomes everybody to come in his name. Nobody is turned away if they come in his name. And if you're sitting here thinking, no, but my life is a mess, ah, perfect timing, you're in the right place. If you're thinking, my life is so awesome, why would I need, you know, come in his name. Uh, and having received it, again, uh, take some time to pray, reflect on it. Uh, I'll, uh, at the end of that, I'll, I'll offer you a benediction. We'll eat, we'll come back and have some conversations. Lord Jesus, we thank you that your grace is sufficient. Uh, that you love us more than anyone has ever loved us. You know us better than anyone has ever known us. You've cared for us more than anyone has ever cared for us. You know more about us and our sins and our failures than anybody else knows. And yet, Lord, you say we are your beloved. You invite us into your presence. You embrace us in your love. You fill us with your grace. And just as you breathe life into us at creation, you continue to breathe the Holy Spirit into us as we open our hearts and minds to you, as we respond to your embrace. We thank you, Lord, that your perfection uh, makes the difference. Your righteousness makes the difference. And that we get to experience that in practical ways, one day at a time, now and forever. So, Lord, receive us as we come in your presence. We pray this in Jesus' high and holy name. Amen. I come and receive communion whenever you're ready.
if there's anything we can do to help you take that next step, to come to Christ, to understand what it means to receive him as Lord and Savior and begin a relationship with him. Uh, if, if you feel like today's a homecoming, I want to come back to Christ. We, we want to help you get back on track with him. If we can help you grow, uh, get into community, whatever we can do, we'd love to be able to help you in any way possible. And so um, get something to eat and come back to conversations you don't want to miss. This is really, really fun. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. Be the Lord who loves you more than you can even ask or imagine. Give you everything you need to walk in newness and fullness of life with him, both now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.